Welcome back, dear friends, to the Crimson Academy's course on a tribute to His Holiness Abdul Baha. Dear friends, we are picking back up on Hassan Baliuzi's immortal work, Abdul Baha, the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Dear friends, we are on chapter 23, the last years of his ministry. The course of the war still had a few more weeks to run, but the isolation of the Holy Land was over. The first post-war contact with Baha'i circles outside the Holy Land was provided with the arrival of Major Tudor Pole at Haifa. He attained the presence of Abdul Baha in the house of Abud in Akka on November 19, 1918. He wrote, The master was standing at the top of the stairway, waiting to greet me with that sweet smile and cheery welcome for which he is famous. For 74 long years, Abdul Baha has lived in the midst of tragedy and hardship, yet nothing has robbed or can rob him of his cheery optimism, spiritual insight, and keen sense of humor. He was looking little older than when I saw him seven years ago, and certainly more vigorous than when in England after the exhausting American trip. His voice is as strong as ever. His step, virile, his hair and beard are, if possible, more silver white than before. He still spends a few weeks now and again in the Akka prison house that has now become his property. After lunch, Abdul Baha drove me out to the garden tomb of Baha'u'llah, about two miles from the city. He approached the tomb in complete silence, praying with bent head, a wonderfully venerable figure in his white turban and flowing gray robe. On reaching the portal to the tomb itself, the master prostrated himself at length and kissed the steps leading to the inner chamber. There was a majestic humility about the action that baffles description. Then I went to pay my respects to the military governor. I returned to the prison house and spent the evening with the master, supping with him and answering his question about the new administration. Then I slept in the room next Abdul Baha's, which was Baha'u'llah's before him, simple attics with stone floors and practically no furniture. Abdul Baha still gives away all money and lives the life of poverty himself. Before breakfast, the house was filled with believers who had come to receive the morning blessing. I had brought Abdul Baha letters from all parts of the world, and he spent the morning dictating replies for me to take away. I gave him the Persian camel hair cloak, and it greatly pleased him, for the winter is here and he had given away the only cloak he possessed. I made him promise to keep this one through the winter anyway, and I trust he does. At lunch we had another long talk. Then came the leave-taking and the master's blessing. He sent greetings by me to all his friends in Egypt, Europe, England and America. As I drove off on my return to Haifa, I caught a glimpse of the master, staff in hand, wending his way through the awful Akka slums on his way to attend 
the local peace celebrations. He stands out, a majestic figure. Shoghi Effendi wrote at the same time to Dr. Lutfullah Hakim in London. Captain, later Major Tudor Paul, surprised and gladdened us with his unexpected arrival from Egypt. The beloved has been sojourning for a month and a half at Akka, visiting almost daily the tomb of his father and offering his thanksgivings for the bounty, care and protection of the Blessed Perfection. I am so glad and privileged to be able to attend to my beloved services after having completed my course of Arts and Sciences in the American University of Beirut. I am so anxious to hear from you and of your services to the cause, for by transmitting them to the Beloved I shall make him happy, glad, and strong. Until he left for England in the spring of 1920 to continue his studies at Balliol College, Oxford, Shori Effendi acted as Abdul Baha's secretary and translated his tablets addressed to the Baha'is of the West. Laura and Hippolyte Dreyfus Barney were the first pilgrims who arrived from the West at the conclusion of the war. Major Tudor Pohl facilitated their journey through the official channels in Cairo. Soon after this, they went to the United States. As soon as the Holy Land had passed out of the hands of its Ottoman rulers, Mrs. Parsons had written to Abdul Baha to request him to revisit America. A few days before, a feast was being held in Chicago on October 16th at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Leo Perron. The su suggestion was made there to supplicate Abdul Baha to come again. The House of Spirituality, the local spiritual assembly of Chicago, decided that such a supplication should go out from all the Baha'is of the land. When it was finally drawn up with the agreement of other local communities, it bore more than a thousand signatures. It read, To our beloved Abdul Baha, we, thy humble servants in America, rejoice that the door of communication is at last open, and we beg of God that it may ever remain so. Unworthy are we, yet we supplicate thee, we beseech thee, if it be God's will to turn thy blessed countenance toward us, that all the regions of the West, even as the East, may be quickened by thy glorious presence. In the past thou didst promise us, in words creative of fulfillment, that when the hearts of their friends were united, then again thou wouldst visit America. Our hearts are united in incessant longing for thee, in complete dependence upon thy love and thy veriest command. May our overwhelming need of thee draw thee speedily to the West and to us, who greet thee in the sacred, wondrous name of El Abha. Abdul Baha replied in May 1919 that their unity and constancy would be the magnet to draw him to America. Previously, he had cabled that the convention about to be held at Hotel McAlpin, New York City, should be the convention of the Covenant, because it was to be the occasion for the unveiling of the Tablets of the Divine Plan. These tablets had lain for a while during the war 
in the vaults under the mausoleum on Mount Carmel. On December 23, 1918, Ahmad Sohrab left the Holy Land to take them to America. During that memorable convention, April 26 through 30th, the annual meeting of Baha'i Temple Unity, the tablets were presented and read to the American Baha'is. With the war at an end, letters and supplications were pouring in. On January 29, 1919, Shoghi Effendi informed Dr. Baghdadi in the United States that nearly a hundred tablets had been revealed for the Baha'is in America. Some had been sent and others would follow. The Baha'is of the East and of Europe were also having their share of this bounty. Pilgrims too were now arriving from both the East and the West, and the officials of the newly established British administration were calling more and more on Abdul Baha. Between 1909 and 1916, a collection in three volumes of Abdul Baha's tablets was published in New York. Preponderantly addressed to American Baha'is, they also contain tablets written to communities and individuals in other parts of the world. The military administration opened a relief fund in Haifa, to which Abdul Baha contributed 50 Egyptian pounds. His name stood at the head of the list. Later he made a further contribution, the following letter of February 10th, 1919, speaks for itself. Your Eminence, I have today received from your grandson, Shoghe Effendi, the sum of 50 pounds as a further donation from yourself to the Haifa Relief Fund. Please accept on behalf of the Committee of Management my very sincerest and most grateful thanks for this further proof of your well-known generosity and care of the poor who will forever bless you for your liberality on their behalf. Please accept the sincerest assurance of my deepest regards and respect. Signed, G. A. Stanton, Colonel Military Governor. Another relief project which Abdul Baha greatly encouraged was the Save the Children Fund which functions today all over the world. Eglantine Jeb was the founder of the organization, which was set up to do exactly what its name indicated. She and her sister were moved to action. In the first instance, particularly by the pitiful condition of children in Central and Eastern Europe. Lady Blomfield, who was a friend of Eglantine Jeb had become associated with her in this humanitarian work, and since she was living a good part of the year in Geneva, she had established a special Blomfield Fund at 4 Rue Masset in that city, which was the headquarters of the International Union of Save the Children, Union Internationale des Secours Enfants. The purpose of the Blomfield Fund, sponsored in London by Lord Weirdal, was to finance workrooms for children or for other relief work of a constructive character, which will increasingly constitute a more and more important part of the activities of the Save the Children Fund movement. The foregoing lines are quoted from a pamphlet which Lady Blomfield wrote under the title The First Obligation. 
This is the foreword to that pamphlet. Extract from a tablet written to Lady Blomfield by Sir Abdu'l-Bahá Abbas, K.B.E. and dated Mount Carmel, Palestine, 23rd July 1921. The pamphlet Thou Didst Compile, Appealing to the World of Humanity, to help these desolate children is very much approved and at its beginning write these words to contribute towards the cause of these pitiful children and to protect and care for them is the highest expression of altruism and worship and is well pleasing to the most high the almighty the divine provider for these little ones have no protecting father and mother, no kind nurse, no home, no clothing, no food, no comfort, no place of rest. In all these things they call for our God kindness, they merit our help, they are deserving of mercy and of our utmost pity. The eyes of all who love justice are filled with tears, and every understanding heart burneth with pity. O ye peoples of the world, show compassion. O ye concourse of the wise, hold out your hands to help. O ye nobles, show loving kindness, be bountiful. O ye wealthy of the earth, shower contributions. O ye men, strong and brave of heart, manifest your benevolence. Abdul Baha's commendation of those who worked for the Save the Children Fund is also contained within that pamphlet. The following is an extract from a tablet of June 1920, written to one such worker. My hope is that, through the especial grace of God, this association, Save the Children Fund, will be confirmed, assisted and strengthened by divine power, that it may day by day progress both spiritually and materially, that it may be protected from every danger, and that the oneness of humanity may, through the work of this society, Save the Children Fund, raise its banner at the zenith of the world. In the evening of July 21st, 1919, a banquet was held at Bahji, offered by a pilgrim. Some forty sat at the richly laden table. Abdul Baha walked round serving the guests. Bedouins had encamped nearby, and they too received a generous share. Then their children came, and to each child Abdul Baha gave a coin. The next morning, when the pilgrims and guests had gone back to Haifa and Akka, and Abdul Baha was sitting in the garden adjacent to the shrine of Baha'u'llah, revealing tablets addressed to the Baha'is of the West, fathers of those children came to offer him their gratitude for his generosity to their children, and to ask for his blessing. Meanwhile, the peace conference in Paris was dragging on amidst fresh controversies and mounting misery in Eastern and Central Europe. In a tablet addressed to David Buchanan of Portland, Oregon, Abdul Baha wrote, Thy letter dated December 2nd, 1918 was received. Although the representatives of various governments are assembled in Paris in order to lay the foundations of universal peace 
and thus bestow rest and comfort upon the world of humanity. Yet, misunderstanding among some individuals is still predominant, and self-interest still prevails. In such an atmosphere, universal peace will not be practicable, nay rather, fresh difficulties will arise. This is because interests are conflicting and aims are at variance. On December 17th of that year, 1919, Abdu'l-Baha revealed one of his most remarkable tablets addressed to the Central Organization for a Durable Peace at The Hague. This organization was not an official body. The president of its executive committee was Dr. H. C. Dresselhuis of Holland. Great Britain was represented by G. Lewis Dickinson and Austria by Professor Dr. H. Lamash, well-known progressive thinkers in their respective countries. Abdu'l-Baha wrote, O ye esteemed ones, who are pioneers among the well-wishers of the world of humanity, the letters which ye sent during the war were not received, but a letter dated February 11th, 1916 has just come to hand, and immediately an answer is being written. Your intention deserves a thousand praises, because you are serving the world of humanity, and this is conducive to the happiness and welfare of all. This recent war has proved to the world and the people that war is destruction, while universal peace is construction. Abdu'l-Baha explained what the basic principles of the faith were, warned the committee that others might come from the East presenting their teachings as their own, and on the question of peace he wrote, Although the League of Nations has been brought into existence, yet it is incapable of establishing universal peace. But the Supreme Tribunal, which Baha'u'llah has described, will fulfill the sacred task with the utmost might and power. And his plan is this, that the national assemblies of each country and nation, that is to say parliaments, should elect two or three persons, who are the choicest men of that nation, and are well informed concerning international laws and the relations between governments and aware of the essential needs of the world of humanity in this day. The number of these representatives should be in proportion to the number of inhabitants of that country. The election of these souls who are chosen by the National Assembly, that is, the Parliament, must be confirmed by the Upper House, the Congress, and the Cabinet, and also by the President or Monarch, so these persons may be the elected ones of all the nation and the government. From among these people, the members of the Supreme Tribunal will be elected, and all mankind will thus have a share therein, for every one of these delegates is fully representative of his nation. When the Supreme Tribunal gives a ruling on any international question, either unanimously or by majority rule, there will no longer be any pretext for the plaintiff or ground of objection for the defendant. In case any of the governments or nations in the execution of the irrefutable decision of the Supreme Tribunal 
be negligent or dilatory. The rest of the nations will rise up against it because all the governments and nations of the world are the supporters of this supreme tribunal. Consider what a firm foundation this is. But by a limited and restricted league, the purpose will not be realized as it ought and should. Abdul Baha addressed a second and shorter tablet to the Hague Committee in July 1920. He wrote, Your kind answer to my letter dated 12th of June 1920 has arrived and greatly pleased me. Praise be unto God that it was indicative of the fact that your motive and purpose is identical with that of ours. Its contents also consisted of spiritual susceptibilities, which are expressive of sincere love. We, Baha'is, feel great affection towards that honorable assembly. Therefore have we sent two honored persons to that highly esteemed assembly as a sign of strong relationship. Today the most important problem in the affairs of the world of humanity is that of the universal peace, which is the greatest means contributing to the very life and happiness of mankind. Without this most luminous reality, it is impossible for humanity to attain to actual comfort and proficiency. Nay, rather, shall it have day by day some actual misfortune and tragedy. Lord Lamington was, in the early part of 1919, directing the Syrian relief work with his headquarters at Damascus. He called on Abdul Baha on July 15th to receive in his own words the blessings of the Master. To Abdul Baha's expressed purpose to return the visit, Lord Lamington said, No, my duty and my privilege is to call on you personally, and I do not wish you to take the trouble to come over to me. Lord Lamington came again on the 17th to bid farewell. He was returning to Britain. On this occasion, Abdul Baha gave him his ring. To Lord Lamington's query, Abdul Baha said that if circumstances permitted, he would go to visit Ishkabad, then Japan, and India. Major General Watson, the Chief Administrator of the Southern Section of Occupied Territory, met Abdul Baha in Haifa on August 23rd at the home of Colonel Stanton, the military governor. On October 4th, Abdul Baha, at the invitation of Major Williamson, the acting military governor of Haifa, went aboard a warship, HMS Marlborough, which had taken part in the Battle of Jutland. He was shown round the ship, and when he was having tea with the commander of the ship, Major Williamson and Captain Lowick, deputy military governor of Akka, he said that this was the first time in his life that he had been on board a man of war, and he hoped and trusted that all the implements and means of warfare would be turned one day into means to promote peace and industrial prosperity, and that all the men of war would eventually become merchant ships, thereby stimulating trade and industry. In the afternoon of 
October 20th. Two Indian soldiers, devout Muslims, arrived at the door of Abdul Baha's house and asked to meet him. Their camp was some distance from Haifa and they had walked all the way. They had first heard of him in India, had been to Mecca where they performed the rites of pilgrimage and now, at the first opportunity, had come to meet him. It was their duty they felt. Kneeling before him, they wept with joy. Abdu'l-Bahá was most kind to them and greeted them as a father. Later they followed Abdu'l-Bahá to the shrine of the Bab. There were many such incidents in the life of Abdu'l-Bahá and many were the pilgrims who were now arriving from the west, among them Dr. and Mrs. Baghdadi, who stayed for a year, George Latimer, Mr. and Mrs. William Randall with their daughter Margaret, Mrs. Corinne True and her daughter Edna True. Dr. John Ebenezer Esselmont arrived on November 4th, he wrote in his immortal work, Baha'u'llah and the New Era. During the winter of 1919 through 1920, the writer had the great privilege of spending two and a half months as the guest of Abdu'l-Bahá at Haifa and intimately observing his daily life. At that time, although nearly 76 years of age, he was still remarkably vigorous and accomplished daily an almost incredible amount of work. Although often very weary, he showed wonderful powers of recuperation and his services were always at the disposal of those who needed them most. His unfailing patience, gentleness, kindliness and tact made his presence like a benediction. It was his custom to spend a large part of each night in prayer and meditation. From early morning until evening, except for a short siesta after lunch, he was busily engaged in reading and answering letters from many lands and attending to the multitudinous affairs of the household and of the cause. In the afternoon he usually had a little relaxation in the form of a walk or a drive, but even then he was usually accompanied by one or two or a party of pilgrims with whom he would converse on spiritual matters, or he would find opportunity by the way of seeing and ministering to some of the poor. After his return, he would call the friends to the usual evening meeting in his salon. Both at lunch and supper, he used to entertain a number of pilgrims and friends and charm his guests with happy and humorous stories, as well as precious talks on a great variety of subjects. My home is the home of laughter and mirth, he declared. And indeed it was so. He delighted in gathering together people of various races, colors, nations, and religions in unity and cordial friendship around his hospitable board. He was indeed a loving father, not only to the little community at Haifa, but to the Baha'i community throughout the world. Dr. Esselmont tells us in the introduction to his book that he had brought the manuscript with him to Haifa at the invitation of Abdu'l-Bahá, who discussed it with him on several occasions and made some valuable suggestions for its improvement. Abdu'l-Bahá's intention was to have it translated into Persian so that he could read and amend it where necessary.
but he was able to correct only three and a half chapters before his passing. In 1924, Dr. Esselmont left England for Haifa at Shore Effendi's invitation, where he died in November 1925 and was posthumously named a Hand of the Cause of God by the Guardian of the Faith. Mirza Asadullah Fazila Mazandarani, a learned Baha'i of Iran, was one of the pilgrims who came at the close of 1919. Abdul Baha directed him to the United States. Fazel reached New York in time for the 12th Annual Convention, 1920, of Baha'i Temple Unity, which was being held once again at Hotel McAlpin. He stayed for a year in America, traveling around the country to assist and stimulate the Baha'i communities. On Tuesday, April 27th, in the afternoon session of the convention, the design for the Mashallah Scar at Wilmette, Illinois, was finally chosen by the 49 delegates present. Designs were submitted by three architects, Louis Bourgeois, William Sutherland Maxwell, and Charles Mason Remy and Louis Bourgeois' design was chosen by a majority vote of the delegates. Upon Remy's proposal, the decision to adopt Bourgeois' plan was made unanimous. The work of boring the ground for the foundation of the building was started on September 24, 1920. On that same April 27th of 1920, in the garden of the military governor of Haifa, Abdul Baha was invested with the insignia of the knighthood of the British Empire. That knighthood was conferred on him in recognition of his humanitarian work during the war for the relief of distress and famine. He accepted the honor as the gift of a just king, but never used the title. Lady Blomfield writes, The dignitaries of the British crown from Jerusalem were gathered in Haifa, eager to do honor to the master, whom every one had come to love and reverence for his life of unselfish service. An imposing motor car had been sent to bring Abdul Baha to the ceremony. The master, however, could not be found. People were sent in every direction to look for him, when suddenly, from an unexpected side, he appeared, alone, walking his kingly walk with that simplicity of greatness which always enfolded him. The faithful servant, Isfandiar, whose joy it had been for many years to drive the master on errands of mercy, stood sadly looking on at the elegant motor car which awaited the honored guests. No longer am I needed. At a sign from him who knew the sorrow, old Isfandiar rushed off to harness the horse and brought the carriage out at the lower gate, whence Abdul Baha was driven to a side entrance of the garden of the governate of Phoenicia. So Isfandiar was needed and happy. French forces occupied Damascus on July 20th, 1920, and King Faisal lost his throne. The following year he gained another throne in Iraq. In between he journeyed here and there. His journeyings took him to Haifa and into the presence of Abdul Baha. General Allenby was another distinguished visitor. He and his wife had luncheon with Abdul Baha at Bahji and Abdu'l-Bahá himself 
conducted them to the shrine of Baha'u'llah. Sir Herbert, later Viscount Samuel, was appointed High Commissioner for Palestine in 1920, once the mandate had been established. He called several times on Abdul Baha at his home in Haifa. Dr. Bartadi, after a year's absence, arrived back in the United States in October 1920. He had much to tell the American Baha'is. Abdul Baha had told him the story of the widow of a martyr in Persia. She had two children to bring up and earned a livelihood by knitting socks. One pair she knitted to provide her children with the necessities of life, and one pair she knitted to earn money to give to the funds for the Mashalaskar in America. On the question of racial harmony, Abdul Baha had reminded Dr. Baghdadi of his statement when in America that blood would flow if nothing were done to establish harmony between the black and the white. The first responses to the tablets of the divine plan brought particular joy to Abdul Baha. Clara and Hyde Dunn set out from California to settle in Australia where they arrived in April 1920. Father Dunn, as Hyde Dunn came to be called, was then 62 years old. He lived to see the establishment of a National Spiritual Assembly in Australia and New Zealand in 1934, and on his death in February 1941, the Guardian of the Faith accorded him the honor of being Australia's spiritual conqueror, and some years later also a hand of the cause. Mother Dunn, in her turn, was raised to the rank of hand of the cause of God by the Guardian. In February 1952, and continued her valiant and inspiring services into her 92nd year. She died in November 1960. Martha Root, who was a journalist by profession, embarked for South America in July 1920. This was the start of her travels to every part of the globe, of visits to kings and queens, presidents and statesmen, to universities and colleges, and the eminent figures of the academic world, as well as to many others outstanding among men, and of attendance at diverse gatherings and conferences, with the sole object of making known the name of Baha'u'llah, and of acquainting those directing the affairs of mankind with his teachings. That heroic woman, left this world in Honolulu in 1939, just when the Second World War had broken out and fresh miseries were to come. By the guardian of the faith whom she had served with such love and fidelity, she was honored with this promise after her death. Posterity will establish her as foremost hand of cause, which Abdul Baha's will has raised up in first Baha'i century. The last month of 1920 witnessed the death of two Baha'is, one still young and one very, very old, whose services enriched the annals of the apostolic age of the faith of Baha'u'llah. Lillian Capps, the distinguished teacher of the Tarbiyat school, whose services Abdul Baha had so much valued, died on December 1st in Tehran. And Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, the veteran of so many battles, died in Haifa on December 27th.
The first All India Baha'i Convention was held in Bombay at the close of the year, December 27th to December 29th. It sent a supplication to Abdul Baha to visit India. The Times of India copiously reported the proceedings of the convention. An eminent visitor was Sir Patrick Jets, who then held the chair of the botany at the Bombay University, and he wrote for the Baha'i News of Bombay. My first acquaintance with the illustrious and saintly leader of the Baha'i movement was as one of his chairmen in course of his lectures in Edinburgh on his tour through the West some years ago before the war. After this meeting, he became interested in the practical methods of my Outlook Tower at Edinburgh and found in these something of that incorporation of science into life and therefore into religion which is one of the tenets in which the Baha'i organization, guided by his teaching, takes so eminent a lead among the religious bodies of the present. He indeed then asked me to deliver a public lecture on those lines to those attending his teachings, which I did under his chairmanship. During each of the past two years, I have been town planning in Palestine, and not only for Jerusalem, but also for his own home city of Haifa, and have thus had more than one opportunity of meeting him again. On the last occasion of calling on him, I had the pleasant duty of conveying to him a unanimous request from Pro Carmel a new society of citizens founded on the lines of the better-known pro-Jerusalem and with the same purpose of advancing all the common interests of the city without distinction of race, party or creed and thus embracing all. Their desire was that he should become the president of this new society which unites Muslims, Jews, Christians, and Baha'is in the work of social service and of civic and regional improvements in all respects, moral and educational, as well as material, hygienic, architectural, and artistic, etc. This office and leadership he cordially accepted to the great satisfaction of all concerned, since all Haifa looks up to and is proud of him as the foremost of their fellow citizens. He also approved and authorized the proposed town planning scheme as arranged between the city engineer, Dr. Siferin, and myself so far as his fairly extensive property on the slope of Carmel above Haifa is concerned. He granted the land for the two new public roads which are required without accepting compensation on the land taken and he also presented a substantial piece of ground for the public school which is required in that vicinity, some 4,000 square meters. Dr. Siferin, in his architectural capacity, has produced a fine scheme for a monumental stairway and Cypress Avenue leading uphill from the Templar Boulevard upon the level plain to the central meeting place of the Baha'i community in Haifa, which, as all Baha'is doubtless know, contains the tomb of the Ba. For this scheme, of which the design is a gift by Dr. Siferin, between 12,000 and 13,000 will be required, but he and I and other friends and sympathizers are confident that this sum will readily be subscribed within a reasonable time by the many members and friends of the Baha'i cause throughout the world. 
Sir Abbas at once expressed himself as approving the design, and gratified by it as at once a useful and needed access and a beautiful and dignified memorial. He granted the land and promised also to compensate from his own ground the small portion of a Muslim neighbor's ground which is also required to complete the scheme. He further gave a subscription of 1,100 to begin the list. But while authorizing us to open a subscription list and send it to friends and sympathizers, he charged us to be careful to explain this as a purely voluntary matter, and not to represent him as in any way pressing his followers or friends to subscribe, and this we of course promise to do. The construction of the Mashal Askar in the United States was raising many problems, and the advice of the master was sought. Abdul Baha told the American Baha'is to take these matters to the coming convention. In the Holy Land, Fujita had arrived from the United States and Lutfullah Hakim from London to serve Abdul Baha. They helped chiefly with the reception of the pilgrims. A house close to Abdul Baha's house had been prepared for pilgrims from the West. Mrs. Emmajine Huag looked after the pilgrims there during the summer of 1921. A little above Abdul Baha's house, land was purchased on the other side of the road for the building of a Western pilgrim house in the future. Abdul Baha was particularly unwell in the early part of 1921. In March, he went to stay for a while in Tiberias. Back in Haifa, he would spend some nights on Mount Carmel in the vicinity of the Shrine of the Bab. That summer, Abdul Baha received a letter from Dr. Auguste Forel, the celebrated Swiss psychiatrist and entomologist. Later, Forel wrote in his testament, in the year 1920, at Karlsruhe, I first made acquaintance with the supra-confessional world religion of the Baha'i founded in the East 70 years ago by the Persian Baha'u'llah. It is the true religion of the welfare of human society. It has neither priests nor dogmas and it binds together all the human beings who inhabit this little globe. I have become a Baha'i. May this religion continue and be crowned with success. This is my most ardent wish. The tablet which Abdul Baha addressed to him in answer to his letter is described by Shori Effendi as one of the most weighty the master ever wrote. These are the opening words of the tablet. O revered personage, lover of truth, thy letter dated July 28, 1921, hath been received. The contents thereof were most pleasing and indicated that, praised be the Lord, thou art as yet young and searchest after truth that thy power of thought is strong and the discoveries of thy mind manifest. And these the concluding words. In conclusion, these few words are written and unto everyone they will be a clear and conclusive evidence of the truth. Ponder them in thy heart. The will of every sovereign prevaileth during his reign. The will of every philosopher findeth expression in a handful of disciples during his lifetime. But the power of the Holy Spirit 
shineth radiantly in the realities of the messengers of God, and strengtheneth their will in such wise as to influence a great nation for thousands of years, and to regenerate the human soul and revive mankind. Consider how great is this power. It is an extraordinary power, an all-sufficient proof of the truth of the mission of the prophets of God, and a conclusive evidence of the power of a divine inspiration. The glory of glories rest upon thee. The isolation from the Holy Land imposed by the war had given an opportunity to the violators in the United States, to whose band Dr. Farid was added, to agitate afresh. They had tried very hard to split the American Baha'i community and Abdul Baha's last years became even more burdened because of their activities, but in the end they failed miserably. In his last tablet addressed to the Baha'is of America, only a fortnight before his passing, Abdul Baha wrote, O ye friends of God! Abdul Baha is day and night thinking of you and mentioning you, for the friends of God are dear to him. Every morning at dawn I supplicate the kingdom of God and ask that you may be filled with the breath of the Holy Spirit, so that you may become brilliant candles, shine with the light of guidance, and dispel the darkness of error. Rest assured that the confirmations of the Abha kingdom will continuously reach you. Through the power of the divine springtime, the downpour of the celestial clouds and the heat of the sun of reality, the tree of life is just beginning to grow. Before long, it will produce buds, bring forth leaves and fruits, and cast its shade over the east and the west. This tree of life is the Book of the Covenant. In America in these days, severe winds have surrounded the Lamp of the Covenant, hoping that this brilliant light may be extinguished, and this tree of life may be uprooted. Certain weak, capricious, malicious, and ignorant souls have been shaken by the earthquake of hatred of animosity have striven to efface the divine covenant and testament and render the clear water muddy so that in it they might fish. They have arisen against the center of the covenant like the people of the Bayan who attacked the blessed beauty and every moment uttered a calumny. Every day they seek a pretext and secretly arouse doubts so that the covenant of Baha'u'llah may be completely annihilated in America. O oh, friends of God, be awake, be awake, be vigilant, be vigilant. Ya Baha'u'llah Pa! Abdul Baha did not rest a moment until he had raised thy cause and the standard of the kingdom of Abha waved over the world. Now some people have arisen with the intrigues and evil aspirations to trample this flag in America. But my hope is in thy confirmations. On November 12th, just 16 days before his ascension, Abdul Baha sent a cable to Roy Wilhelm in New York which showed the depth of his concern for that community of the West whose creation, training, and protection had constituted one of the major aspects of his ministry. This cable is the expression of his heartfelt longing for their spiritual safety. I implore health from divine bounty, Abbas. The American Baha'i community remained firm and undivided.